So good evening. Again, if you don't know me, my name is Father Brian Foos. I'm the head of St. Andrew's College, and this college is a new college. Um, it is one of many micro colleges that are popping up. I think uh, we counted about 13 or so. Um, this is our uh, second summer dialogue and discussion. And um, as you've probably all seen, we had a graphic talking about history. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to pull that graphic up so I don't mess it up. But uh, the title for tonight is history discovering the 23 and me of your identity. Let me introduce to you um, uh, uh, at this point an old friend. And we met at a Society for Classical Learning conference. We, I believe it's about 17 years ago. May, might be just 18. Um, he came out and was a speaker at a St. Andrew's Day conference. And uh, he's been a part of St. Andrew's ever since. So very thankful for that. Uh, he has been on our international advisory board for at least 15, 16 years. Um, he has come in and done guest lecturing numerous times. Uh, he has uh, participated with our students for probably 13, 14, 15 years in helping them to get into colleges. Um, and then most recently he's taken over our rhetoric courses and our um, senior thesis course um and uh, in fact uh emma had him as a senior thesis uh instructor so you can if you want off screen you know another time you can ask her opinion of dr seal he has uh um uh, with my high school students he's periodically frightened them greatly um so uh he is the um on our team uh and has been for a long time to get saint andrews college started and he is the Dean of our Academics, uh, Dr. John Seal. Take it away, please. Well, I'm gonna break protocol and start because I'm a teacher with a quiz. And so I need you to unmute. Uh, there was a very famous American person that I want you to identify who is famously known for stating history is bunk. Who was that person? Do you know Father Fuss? So history uh, is bunk, is that the quote? Yeah, history is bunk. I do not know. Uh, that was Henry Ford. A uh, follow-up question if you're a historian is, when did he say it? And he said it in May of 1916 in the Chicago Tribune. And if you're a good historian, you would ask the follow-up question, why do you think he said it? And all of his biographers, who are all academics and all historians, um, obviously find his sentiment uh, offensive. And so there's a lot of hand-wringing in academic circles. Why would Henry Ford, the famous car industrialist, say history was bunk? Some have said he said it because he was a isolationist, and did not want the United States to get involved in World War I. And he perceived Europe as being saturated with history. America is new on the stage of history and forward looking. And so we do not like to be bothered with studying the past and particularly a past that we can't change. Others have said, no, actually, it's because he had just launched the Model T in 1908, and he wanted to get people to think about the future away from horse and buggies to the car. And so he was a Ford-oriented, and he wanted to have 
a cheap transformation for the common man. So by saying history is bunk, he could identify with the common man and not the elite academics. There are some historians who are biographies of him who have said, actually, the reason he said it is because he's ignorant. <laughs> uh, once they asked him, when did America start? His answer was 1867, which is of course wrong. And uh, he didn't know anything really about history. Now, uh, if you've watched any television, you know that Jay Leno and Jesse Waters often go out on the street and ask people historical questions. And the amount of historical ignorance of American average person on the street is truly staggering. Uh, we have a major war going on in Europe at this time. 34% of Americans could not find Ukraine on a map. Uh, only 44% of Americans know what the three branches of the government are. And only 30% of Americans know that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. So the amount of historical ignorance in America is epidemically staggering. And people wonder if democracy can survive if we have that level of ignorance. Now, I want to make actually a much more personal question. Um, I'm going to outline five reasons why history is important, but they're really not academic answers to the question. They're personal questions. Namely, I'm going to say you cannot know who you are unless you study history. And history serves as the social DNA. In other words, you can take a test, 23andMe, do your gene test, and you can find out where your ancestors came from. You can find out your medical liabilities. But what you can't find out very effectively is who you are and what is the meaning of your life. Um, now, I say to all students who are considering college, never take any course unless they give you a real reason for why you should be taking it. And so you should never take a history course unless you have a really firm grasp on why it's important. And one of the reasons for this talk tonight is for me to tell you why I think history is important. Now, it's probably honest to say I am a history major and I have a degree, a doctoral degree in a quasi historical subject. It's half sociology and half history. But uh, the reason you should study history is not to become a historian. The reason you should study history is to know who you are and your place in the world. And you can think about it this way. If you were to go into a movie 20 or 30 minutes late and leave 20 or 30 minutes early, you would know something about the movie, but you would not actually have any idea of how the whole arc of the story fit in. And philosophers have said, you cannot know what to do with your life unless you first know what story your life is a part of. Now, all of us just were thrown into existence in the middle of history without any choice in the matter. And uh, we are marching out our future and we have a past that precedes us. Heidegger used the term thrownness as a description of how we need to make sense of our own existence. And um, there are two ways that we need to think about our own histories. 
One is our resume history, and the other is our heart history. Our resume history is the thing we write on college recs and uh, send off to companies that were applying for jobs. It's our public face. Uh, it's on our Vita. But actually, that's not the real you. The real you is your heart history, which goes to what you love, what are your dreams, what are your aspirations. And those things change over time, but they actually frame the course of your entire life. Uh, last weekend, I finished a book. It was uh, a book about an alleged church scandal of a minister in North Carolina. And I did uh, many, many hours of interviews to get the story from him and his wife before I wrote the book. Now, I was not approaching this project as if I was an investigative reporter or even a historian. I was simply telling the story that he was telling me. And I'm assuming that what he remembers about the experiences he had 10, 12 years ago are those events that were most meaningful, perhaps most painful in shaping his life. What he was giving me was not his resume story, but his heart history. That is the order of the past that he was giving me was in fact the order of his heart. Now, the thing to say is that the past shapes us in very powerful ways. Faulkner said, the past is never dead. It is never past. The past shapes who we are and who we will become. And so you'll never have any meaning in your life unless you know your place in history. Just like you can't have any meaning in a movie if, in fact, you pop into the middle of it and leave it before it ends. You will not actually know what the, the total story of the movie is. You won't know how it uh, worked out. In fact, uh, in uh, the movie Ben-Hur, when I was a kid, my sister was so scared of the horse race, the very famous horse race, that we had to leave the movie during the horse race. And I have never seen that movie Again, now, obviously, I don't know anything about how that ended. I know that there was a crash, uh, but I, uh, I really don't know that story because I left before it ended. So the first reason we need to study history is because your life is a part of a larger story and you will never have meaning in your life unless you understand your historical place within that larger story. Now, it gets a little muckier at this point, and that's because this important larger story that your life is a part of, most of it that shapes you is unconscious. That is, most of the larger story that shapes your life powerfully is history that has been swallowed and is largely invisible to you. That is, your view of yourself, your view of reality is shaped by unconscious dispositions and attitudes. Now, academics have a term for this. It's called habitus. Um, but uh, let me give you a personal illustration. I grew up overseas. I grew up in grew up in South Korea. My parents were medical missionaries. They were there for 37 years. I was there for 17. I went to high school through Korea. And uh, if you know anything about Korea, uh, prior to the modern era for about 45 years, they were colonized very brutally by the Japanese. And um, it was only later in my life that I came to realize without ever studying this consciously in school, 
I have all the biases and prejudices that a 60 year old Korean would have about the Japanese. In other words, for me, the Japanese are Asian Nazis. Now, it's not actually true, and I know better, but I know also that just by growing up in Korea, I developed certain prejudices that carry forward in my mind, even though I'm kind of a cosmopolitan, think of myself as sophisticated person, I have all of these biases that I have inculcated simply because I grew up in a particular place in a particular history and somehow I absorbed those perspectives and attitudes. Now, you'll never actually have control of your life unless you understand what are the hidden dispositions that are shaping your behavior. Uh, I'm gonna not go into this anymore, but we can jump back at this. So the thing that history gives you is a sense of agency or control over your life, it gives you some perspective on your life. The third thing I wanna say is that history is very important because it reminds you that we are more than an island. Uh, one of the fallacies today is that we are, uh, that the truest thing about uh, reality is our authentic self, our individual authentic self. I've got to be true to me and to my authentic self. Well, unfortunately, your authentic self has a context and it's never uh, just you. You are in a family system. You're in a community, in a place, in a particular moment of history. And all of those things shape you. And the other thing to say is that reality is not individual. Reality is fundamentally relational. And history reminds us of this, that no individual is just an individual. Now you can see this most acutely in marriage. Marriage is never the bringing together of two individuals. It is the bringing together of two family systems, and dare I say, two histories, including the history of the past. So on one side of my family, I have a history that comes out of Baden-Baden, Germany, and they were immigrants in 1840, uh, 1845. Uh, and on my mother's side, I have a history out of Scotland, uh, just north of Edinburgh. And so I have Scottish and German. And um, the Scottish side of my family tends to be uh, romantic and uh, like Browning. And the Germanic side tends to be Germanic, a very engineering and left brain. And so my personality has a kind of war between them. And my name, Seal, is actually a bastardization of the German word Zele, which means soul in German. So my own history takes these two sides and blends them together. And to this day, I wrestle with those two sides in my very personality because history is swallowed. It's invisible to ourselves, but we can only get some perspective on who we are when we begin to study not only our own history, but history in general, so that we know our place within the world. So history teaches us that fundamentally we are made for community. The fourth thing is simply to say this, that um, the study of history keeps you from being blind to your own time. C.S. Lewis called this problem chronological snobbery. 
that you're so arrogant that you think that the only thing that is actually real and true and really up to date is what's happening right now. And that's a kind of arrogance that he said, we've got to overcome if we're not going to be provincial kind of people. Um, now, a lot of young people know that there's a certain I don't know, what's the right word? Maybe gravitas, uh, coolness doesn't quite get it. Hipness is not quite right, but there's something authentic about vintage clothes. Uh, they're made with care. They're not made by factory. Uh, they allow you to express your own authenticity because you're moving out of your own, what everyone else is doing. Uh, but there's something valued in something that is vintage in that regard. And uh, one of the things that we've got to avoid is thinking that just because something is trendy and something is new, it's automatically better. Uh, that notion is itself a modern notion. Nobody ever thought before now that just because something was new, it was better. Now, let me give you just a contrast. So I grew up in another culture and in the Asia and Korea, it's Confucian. And in Confucian society, age is revered. When you turn 60, there's a huge party and you get to wear a certain kind of clothes and everybody begins to talk to you with a much more formal respect uh, and um, age is honored. And uh, my mother went back to Korea after being away for many number of years. She went to see one of her old friends and her old friend said to her automatically as she walked into her store, Mary, you look so old. Now that was the highest compliment she could have given her. Now you begin to see we don't think that way here. And so the fact of the matter is this idea that the trendiness, trendiest is not always the best, it's not the, most, uh, not the most authentic, is a modern concept that we've got to get away from. And how do you get away from that? There's only two ways. There are only two ways to keep from being provincial or to overcome chronological snobbery. One is travel, and the other is the study of history. Because I grew up overseas, I thought it was really important for my boys to travel. So when my son was 12, I put him on a plane all by himself, flew him to Europe, and he worked on a sheep farm all by himself, 40 miles north of Inverness, which is way up in Scotland, for a summer. What he learned from that is he hates sheep. That's what he learned. But uh, the experience of living in a different place in a different culture, enormously valuable. And uh, history gives you the opportunity to move beyond yourself and it gives you breadth. One last point and then we'll take some comments and questions. The other thing history teaches you, it gives you hope. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then God is actually involved in the writing of your history. God is actually working out with you your own life. And he's working it out for your good. History teaches us to have confidence in our destiny because of God's providence. In Ephesians, and mind you, this is in a um, quasi-paraphrased version, uh, but I like it nonetheless. In Ephesians 2.10, we read, we have become God's poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny that he has given each of us 
for we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one, even before we were born. God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. The fact of the matter is we study history. We study history because God is actually in the process of write, helping us write our own history and helping us even overcome our own errors and mistakes and working them out for our own good so that we can have confidence and rest in our place in history and in where God is taking us in our own history. Now, St. Andrew's College requires more history than almost any other liberal arts college. It's history and literature. And it wants to do so not because it wants to make you a historian, but it wants you to know the why of your life. It wants you to be able to live lives with meaning, with some sense of personal agency, to know your place within a wider community, and to have a broad perspective on your moment of history so that you can move forward with confidence in God's providential care and actually be a change maker in your generation. In my opinion, there are few other areas of study that can offer more value to you as a person in terms of your own future direction in your life than the study of history. People will say, well, John, what can you do with a history degree? I'll tell you very simply, what you can do is you can be a leader. Every serious leader in history has been a student of history. You think of Churchill, Patton, Mathis, Lee, all of them were great students of history. So history is not actually bunk. It's one of the great values that can help shape your life and give your life some sense of meaning and purpose so that you know your place in time and you know how to actually operate within the story of your life in a way that makes a fundamental difference. And that's why that St. Andrews College history is such a priority. Okay, now over to you. Thoughts or questions or comments? May I introduce Alison Steinberg? Oh, excuse me, Alison Bartel. Uh, Hello, who, Alison. I who know has, her. Um, been I teaching. know her in both versions. <laughs> and she has been teaching, for those of you who don't know her, she's been teaching uh, history at St. Andrews uh, for many moons, uh, just, just long enough to get married. Um, Alison, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Seal. It's good to be here. Um, you mentioned that a lot of the things that um, a lot of our history is just swallowed and we don't really know it. Um, we studied this year a little bit, very little bit, because we were doing modern history about Freud, Sigmund Freud, and his whole thing was most of what motivates us, it, it, you know, is forces we don't know, um, which, you know, psychology and psychiatry has backed a little bit away from, not completely, but, you know, we kind of... Freud is kind of honored in the in the neglect of him. Mm -hmm. So how how is that? How is it not? I don't think you're saying, oh, we're motivated by all these secret things that we don't understand completely, but maybe a little bit of that when you interact with that. Uh, yes. Well, where Freud is getting hammered is because he was a reductionist. And he basically said the animating motivation is sexual. And so where he's getting uh, hammered is on his reductionism on motivation. I think there would still be a large consensus on the power of the subconscious, that there's more going on in our subconscious mind and what shapes it than we're aware of. 
Now the word habitus actually came from Aristotle. It's developed most fully in a French social theorist by the name of Pierre Bourdieu. Uh, and uh, he's who I did my doctorate on. So, uh, but let me give you an illustration, for example. Now, a little controversial, but it'll help you see it in one sense, practically. 81% of American evangelicals voted for Trump. Generally speaking, historians of American evangelicals like George Marsden and others have said, American evangelicals in public do not actually operate on the basis of their theology. They operate on the basis of their commitment to certain myths, legends, or subconscious history or habitus. Americans operate in history on the basis of their habitus. Now, there are five or six characteristics of American evangelicalism. So uh, the, I would say the first one is rain. That is the notion of a Christian America that comes from the 18, uh, six, 1630s to 1800s, which is the Puritan period where we get our attitudes of majoritarianism. Second was the second great, second great, second great awakening. Uh, and we get revivalism. And from that, we get um, both populism and pietism that are characteristic of Jacksonian populism. That, um, and a lot of the contemporary populist nationalism comes out of that ethos. In the progressive era from 1880s to 1930, all of the main institutions in American society that were Christian became secular. There was a, a loss of religious hegemony during that period, and an attitude of resentment emerged. So we have rain, revival, resentment. And so we get a, a sense of grievance. The end of that loss of resentment, that, that period of resentment, was the Scopes trial in 1925. That would be the back end of that, in effect. Um, the evangelicals won the trial and lost the culture uh, at the same time. And so there's been this sense that something was stolen from us or we have a resentment and a grievance. And then there was a retreat. Uh, that is, uh, evangelicals developed a lifestyle enclave and they developed Christianity Today, Gordon Conwell, Fuller Seminary. And neo-evangelicalism moved away from fundamentalism, and you had the modernist fundamentalist debate, and we developed our own subculture. Uh, then uh, we decided that the, we would take back our culture, and with the rise of the moral majority in the 1970s, we have a reassertion, and we have a sense of power and militarism and politicization, all characteristic of American evangelicalism. And now, particularly among the young, we have a, the fourth, the, excuse me, the sixth uh, R, we have a reassessment. That is, there are cracks in the habitus, and a lot of people are deconstructing, uh, they are emergent, or they're in the potential of reconstruction, and at the same time, all the institutions that were created during the retreat period are all collapsing because they've lost, like Gordon Conwell, have lost half of their student population. And so they're selling their campus. Now, my point is this. You, have, you don't have to be a student of American religious history to know that what characterizes most American evangelicals as their sense of uh, majoritarianism, uh, populism, grievance, uh, a sense of retreat from the rest of society, uh, and uh, a politicized reassertion back into society. Trump, in a very secularized way, spoke to five of those six.
it just fit like a glove, not because they liked his lifestyle or liked his theology, which was zero or anything else, but the tone and language of the subconscious framing of the whole conversation was connecting the deeply entrenched subconscious animating perspectives on life, which have shaped them just like my attitudes toward the Japanese have shaped me unconsciously. I never studied this stuff. And yet going to a movie like Unbroken is probably not helpful for me without some self you know, reflection. And I've sat down with Mako Fujimura, you know, my good Japanese friend and talked about this a great deal because I don't want to have these kind of biases, which are, I mean, it's a kind of subconscious racism in my case toward the Japanese. Now, all I'm saying is there's more going on in our subconscious shaped by history that we have swallowed than we're aware of. And the way we can begin to see this is begin to a study history, have some categories. And if you want to do some careful reassessment is not to pretend like these things aren't there, but to re, we have to come up with a new habitus. We have to reframe the whole conversation at a subconscious level. Uh, now, Bourdieu uses the term socio analysis rather than psychoanalysis. We need to do some socio analysis in order to be able to reframe our thinking in a more coherent way. Now, do I have any confidence that in, uh, 2024, depending on who's going to run, that we've overcome the power of these subconscious attitudes, which, mind you, do not necessarily have to align with our theology. They're more powerful than our theology because they're invisible and unconscious. And so one of the things we need to do in the study of history is to bring out into the open those things that are hidden and buried. And that helps us to have conversations about them and to be able to reflect on them. That's what I mean. It's not Freudian except for the power of the unconscious. And if I could say, it's, it's possible to find it. You know, sometimes you think of Freud as like, well, it's all just hidden and very, very hard to get at. But it sounds like there's hope of like, we can actually with study and care, find out what's underneath. If I'm hearing you right. Yes, I think yeah. so. I really do believe so. Um, and uh, the hope for the future of uh, the reason I'm a champion of millennials and Gen Z is that, um, and particularly those that are grew up in the Pacific Northwest, is they're so unbelievably secular, they haven't been shaped by any of this habitus. So my problem was, I know that habitus is really hard to change and that it's inveterate within us and also almost always invisible. Who actually has a new blank slate is not shaped in that way? People who grew up outside of the South in particular, uh, who didn't have that influence. So I think there's great hope, but do we need to reconstruct a new frame and tell a better story? Yes. Has the church been able to do that very effectively? No. Is that one of the missions of St. Andrews as it frames the discussion historically? Absolutely. But it's also to simply say, history is more powerful than we're actually aware of. And not in some kind of academic sense. It's powerful in making you, you, or me, me. Thank you. Dr. Steele, if I can break in. No. Um, uh, Matthew has his hand up. Yes, Matthew. 
Um, <clears throat> so something that I was kind of curious, and I think you really started framing how to do it in your answer to Allison's question. But I think what I what kind of came to my mind is the idea of the the importance of knowing where we've come from, as opposed to you know like the, the idea of, like you talked about of like waking up in the middle of a field and having no clue how you got there, no where no clue where you are, no clue where you're going. Um, how then have like and how then do we be leaders and how then do we take what we what history has shown us to plot a, a map going forward without making maybe some of the stumbling blocks of like direct correlation you know it's like oh it happened this way in Rome so the fall of you know another nation will be just like that or something but like making learning from the past so that we can ha like how would how would we do that and I think you kind of framed it in your answer but not just like figuring out where we are but where we're going well if you've ever taken a course in history from me I'm going to say two things that are contradictory so uh, you will know that I place a pretty importance on knowing dates in other words, if I were to tell you what happened in the 14th century, it would be helpful to know that that was, you know, um, the end of the, you know, that it was, uh, you know, the plague happened then. And in other words, it's important to know what was happening at that particular time and the collapse of the feudal system, et cetera. Um, But the other thing to say is that the study of history is more than just the study of facts and more than just the study of big battles and wars. It's understanding the cultural ethos that shapes a particular time and place. Uh, in other words, I actually think that one of the things that we're trying to actually inculcate in a fresh new way in St. Andrew's College is a pre-modern vision of reality where there is enchantment in nature and the immediacy of God's presence everywhere, a sacramentalist understanding of reality, which is very long way away from a disenchanted understanding that characterizes the world of advanced modernity. Now, how do we get there? Well, we have to learn the history of the late Middle Ages, and uh, we have to learn to appreciate the uh, English spiritual tradition from Wales and uh, Ireland and the Celtic tradition, and we have to learn those things that preceded uh, the rise of modernity. In other words, we have to become pre-modern in order to address a post-modern world if we're to actually capture and return to a truly biblical understanding of reality. So what's important is not simply to know the dates and times, but to understand, understand the cultural dimensions of each period of history and its relationship. Or put it this way, we need to connect a historical understanding, and the academic term for that is genealogy, we need to have a genealogical perspective connected to a sociological perspective, and that will give us the richness that we need. Does that help? Dr. Seal, uh, I had a, well, some thoughts anyways that I'll see if I can address into a question. Um, I think that last, point was very instructive um i mean i've been living i've been living with a small you know community of teachers and students for 23 years uh an attempt to do what you've just explained and there is a sense of always swimming against the current um 
pragmatically speaking, or, or maybe practically speaking, um, can you give us an example of with, with gaining more and more insight of a pre-modern perspective on the world by studying the history of ideas, philosophy, theology, literature, and of course, all the historical context. Um, how would this shape our perspective on contemporary life, the war in Ukraine, um, inflation, the, econ the economy? I mean, doesn't this basically shape how we look at everything? Yes. I mean, it, it would shape the way you look at everything. In other words, C.S. Lewis called himself a dinosaur, and by that he meant that he consciously adopted a pre-modern position on perspective on reality, that he was a pre-modern living in a modern world, so he called himself a dinosaur, and he was not ashamed of that at all because he actually thought the pre-modern was actually closer to reality. Now, what we're actually finding is that advanced quantum mechanics of uh, quantum physics is actually connecting more to a pre-modern view of reality than the Newtonian physics of uh, this middle period. In other words, we're beginning to understand the interconnectedness of all reality. We're beginning to understand what in biblical terms we would call a Trinitarian understanding of reality. And it's being reaffirmed both in neuroscience and in physics at the highest level. So I think, I, you know, frankly, in my view, I'm, I'm a little jealous of people your daughter's age because I think this is the most interesting time in history to be alive. Uh, and I'm kind of sad I'm gonna miss some of the show because um, the fact of the matter is we're at an inflection point. Advanced modernity is no longer working. It's falling apart. We're living in a Nietzschean world. Uh, nihilism is the prevailing, you know, everything is upside down. We have no sense of reality. Everything's at sea uh, and it doesn't work. And uh, so, there's never been a more exciting time to recapture a traditional biblical understanding of reality. The problem is, is two problems. One, the church, the, by and large, the American evangelical church is bought into the ethos of the problem. And it can't keep itself from very public sin, which undermines its legitimacy and credibility. So we have two sets of problems. One is scandal and the other is uh, heresy. Well, in my view, heresy, which is this marriage of theology, Christian theology with the enlightenment mindset, which shapes advanced modernity. And I think uh, one of the strengths of St. Andrew's College is its enthusiastic and joyful acceptance of being weird. Or by that I mean, I'm quoting Emma there, of being countercultural, of being, uh, we're committed to being old school because we actually think that's where reality points us because we want to live in an enchanted world where there are real dragons and we're equipping people to fight real dragons. And I'm like, that's exciting. That's the kind of world I wanna be in and that's the kind of school I wanna be a part of. And uh, nobody else is, uh, in my view, crazy enough or gutsy enough to, to believe that that is where we need to be, what we need to be doing. And the people who actually understand this uh, are the people who understand the power of spirituality and enchantment 
and the dark academics are Gen Z millennials. They're like this pablum of cultural Christianity that you've been passing off to us is totally uninteresting. And so they're abandoning it. And I'm like, yep, you should. I totally am sympathetic. You know, if I had to go through some of the churches that you've been in, I would probably be as radically deconstructed as you are. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, by God's grace, I got to be with some people who saw reality in the view of Lewis and opened up a wider world, and I knew there was something more. So, Dr. Steele, would you see the rise of the nuns, as in none of the above, and the, the rise of the irreligious in the younger millennials and the post, uh, excuse me, the uh, Generation Z, would you see that as a product of this pablum? Yes. And, yeah. And so- well, Two things I would say, um, nuns are not atheists. They're, they're just not buying into the church because of its pablum. They so, want authenticity. They want reality. They want community. They want enchantment. And I'm like, yeah, me too. And so um, uh, I think the nuns are uh, a happy opportunity, a happy, you know, a happy opportunity. Now, are there challenges with them? But I think um, to a large extent, they are closer to the truth than many of their parents. Or at least more honest about it. Mm -hmm. That too. Other thoughts, other questions? Uh, Mr. Turney, I believe you got your hand up. That's my Zoom hand. Um, <laughs> uh, so Dr. Seal, uh, the three histories that I, Oh, no. What's wrong, Chris? Um, my computer. Technical difficulties. You can also type your question in the chat and I can get it that way. <laughs> Just when he was ready to talk. Uh, let's let him figure that out. Anyone else have comments or uh, questions for Dr. Seal? Uh, we're going to go to James. Chris, just kind of let us know when you're ready. James, you got your hand up? Uh, yes, sir. I, uh, being a member of the younger generation, as you guys have been talking about, mm -hmm. I do find it very interesting what you're mentioning about how uh, we're a really good opportunity. And I do agree because of uh, they have kind of reached, I wouldn't say rock bottom, but I almost mm -hmm. want to point it out that way as that we have kind of hit a point in the the status of a lot of people I know in my life where they're just struggling to find anything of substance at all, especially in the church where they're just finding uselessness and the mm -hmm. really the church is trying to come to them. And that's something that we actually aren't interested in. I've that's noticed true. some of my friends going away from the church, especially in the college, like most people, yeah. because nothing is interesting anymore. And I feel like a pre-modern view on life is really missing and lacking a lot of the youth culture. And actually, I do notice people are looking for it as much as they want to say that they're too smart or too advanced in their social media and they think they know everything now and they think the world is all connected and it's all been solved. But really, I can see it in their eyes and especially when they, uh, they light up when they talk to me and some friends of mine and all kinds of just things that have any sort of substance. 
Yeah. And I'm really glad I go to a school that allows people to talk about things that yeah. actually matter. So. Well, uh, you're exactly right. Here's the difference. The older world lived in a world without windows. They were, you know, the old atheists. And the problem is that the church is fighting young people as if they're in that box, and they're not at all. They're in a world with a skylight. Now, the fact of the matter is, they have no idea what is beyond the skylight. But they're open to the possibility, and they're haunted by that possibility, and they're afraid of missing out on that possibility. Exactly. Now, That's they'll go... Cool. They will go in every possible direction to find it. The last place they'll look is obviously the church where their parents put them. The church, because uh, they're going to operate in the, been there, done that. Thank you very much, please. Um, there's nothing there. And, uh, but the fact of the matter is when you've looked for love in all the wrong places, at some point you're going to come back to some kind of reality. And what we've got to demonstrate is, look, there is actually real rock bottom reality here in an enchanted world that is possible to connect to. And uh, a lot of the times we can connect to them by getting them to begin to see the possibility of transcendence in nature. Thank you. But you're exactly spot on in your assessment. Thank you, James. Um, I know that Christopher's computer froze. Uh, I think he's, uh, uh, I think he's gonna text Emma the question. So Emma, be ready for uh, Christopher to send you a question. Um, the, um, it seems to me that the very few in just contemporary life, <laughs> I was gonna say something, I think it's much worse than I was gonna say. I think it's as bad as no one even understands that they don't have a very good perspective. Their perspective is so bad and they don't even understand there could be a different way to look at something. I know that um, for most of us that grew up uh, in the late 20th century in sort of the uh, apex of modernity, I've talked to so many, Dr. Seal's done this too, many of you have, the assumptions are just automatic. Modernity was the air we breathed, we, that's the, it's the water we swam in as fish. It's just, this is what we are. And an example of that was um, our students, our, our academy students were at a national conference, church conference, and we sang. And um, at one point in the business, a bishop got up and um, he said, you know, one of the problems with where we've been lately is that we don't have the young people. It hasn't been great to have these young people here. And I'm like, all right, that's good. You know, they're encouraged. And he says, and so I'm here calling for a national youth ministry program. This is what we need. And I just shake in my head going, no, that's, that's exactly the wrong thing. That's not what we need. Um, but that's the water and the air that this, you know, that this guy swam in and breathed. He just, he, he knew of no other way to approach life except as an enlightenment modernist. So uh, there's a magazine called Christian Grandfather's Magazine. That's what we call a real niche magazine. And I just wrote an article for them and said, how come youth groups are not being run by grandfathers? <laughs> In other words, so we have a problem that we have all these... Uh, isolated, angry males without fathers doing gross mass shooting violence. 
25% of American boys grow up without a father. Worldwide, the number is 7%. <laughs> so three times more young men are growing up without fathers. I'm like, well, how come uh, grandfathers are not running youth groups and stepping in because they don't have to be hip. All they have to do is listen and be present and be non-judgmental and not freak out if somebody curses and just, you know, um, the fact is I found all they want is presence and listening just all you have to do is just go and say tell me what's going on and and just listening and be interested you know how else would i have learned about street skateboarding and met and shook hands with tony hawk if i you know just took that posture um, the fact of the matter is i don't have to i'm as old school as old school can be and yet, uh, I am the biggest champion there is of millennials and Gen Zs in the country. There's nobody more believing in empowering young people, which is why I'm proud that we're the only college in America that has a Gen Z director of college admission. <laughs> And that's because we believe that if somebody is going to talk to a prospective student, nobody can do it more effectively than somebody who understands their world. Dr. Seal, let me break in and Chris Turney is back. So Chris, do you want to um, make your comments, questions? Far away, Chris. Sure. Um... So I can't even tell if you can hear me or see me. I can. Um, I can okay. do both. Both. Wow. Okay, great. Um, okay. Uh, so, Dr. Seal, uh, my question would be um, the preservers, uh, the you know, not, not the authors of history, but the recorders of history, um, you know, maybe Herodotus or Thucydides or any others, um, even uh, authors in the Bible, um, they write to record history, but do so still with uh, with a conscious or you know unconscious bent or bias, um, because they're you know they're people <laughs> like we are. Um, so when we say that, you know, we we need to study history when we say that we want to study history. Um, do we mean to say that we want to study those who recorded history? Do we mean to say that, well, we're studying those guys who, who wrote about it? Um, uh, maybe, you, maybe you see the gist of my concern. I, oh, no, that's, um, a good one. that's a good one. Now, sure. uh, so now, your question is the next level conversation. All right, so first let's say, okay, I agree, we gotta study history. Then the next question is, what kind of history do we wanna study? And third question is, if we're going to study history, we've gotta recognize that we have to study historiography and understand that the historians themselves have a perspective. So if you're gonna get an angle on X, Y, or Z person, you're gonna to have to read more than one perspective in order to get at the truth of the matter. And you're gonna to have to use discernment in the study of history to get at the history, right? Now, I'm all with you all the way on that. The problem is it might, that's a little more sophisticated down the road. We first got to get people to read anybody. 
so that they actually know what happened, just the basics, like when America started. Uh, you know, I mean, just the basics. Uh, and then um, now, for example, do you really think you can understand Ukraine and Putin without understanding Russian history? No. Do you think you can understand Ukraine without understanding Russian literature, since much of the Russian literature comes from the very region? Do you think it might be helpful to recognize that the spiritual Mecca of Russian Orthodoxy is Kiev? Uh, do you think it might be helpful to understand the Russians' understanding of land and earth and Mother uh, Russia is actually fundamentally different from the West? And do you think that Putin is actually operating within that framework? Yes. Now, my point is to simply say, how are you going to get at that? not by reading newspapers, you're going to have to study history. Uh, and um, that will give you a depth of perspective, a nuance that will he help you make practical decisions today because um, you know, and I would also say, do you think that uh, lots of Ukrainians are conflicted on this point? subconsciously. On one hand, they have a Russian perspective on reality. And on the other hand, they have a Western European perspective on reality. And those two are not the same. Do you think that there is cognitive dissonance in lots of the Ukrainians living in the Donbass region? You bet there is. Does that mean there's going to be certain kinds of um, ambiguities that you're going to have to take into consideration? Yeah, why? Because frankly, history embeds itself in us. We're complex people, and we don't even know how complex we are. All that we know is we're shaped by history that came before us, that's going to be after us. We're plucked into the middle of it, and we're shaped by these forces that we can't even see or recognize. Now, does that mean that's going to be helpful for the State Department to know some of those nuances, I would dare say. Um, and so, um, and that's true of, you know, every place you live. Where, where are you living now? Um, Atlanta, Georgia. All right, Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> so Atlanta is known for its family secrets. So you have these old families with lots of family secrets. Uh, and the culture of Atlanta uh, and the uh, race relations that are associated with that, the power of Coca-Cola within the city, which is dominant, um, the history of the Falcons, football team as it relates to race. Um, all that is dovetailed up in, and it's a very different world than if you were to live in Manhattan. And that all shapes the way, you know, you are and, you know, who you are and the kind of perspectives that you have. But the fact of the matter is, all of us have that same thing. You were thrown into that world. You didn't choose it, but it has shaped you in powerful ways. And on the back end of that point, God will use it in the writing of your story. There's no experience that you have, no wounds that you have that God can't remake and use as he writes the poem of your life. Dr. Seal, um, it strikes me as you were talking that you know, the other major uh, emphasis, if you will, in, in St. Andrew's College is literature. And yes. history and literature go hand in hand, and they're taught chronologically along. So you're, you're covering history in the same time you're covering literature, uh, the, the literature of that period. And, you know, we just had a Flannery O'Connor session last week, and she is someone who is shaped by her place, 
shaped by her time in history and uh, shaped by her faith. And that interesting mix produces this. And she uh, also had a pre-modern perspective on reality. Yep. Yeah. And, and you know, you, you go around the country and you see writers that reflect their place and reflect, you know, what you were just telling Mr. Turney that- Like Faulkner. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, more and more crazy people, the further we get down this road, but, um, but it's, a, it's a fascinating, uh, because that's, when we read these authors, we're reading history too. Well, we're actually answering uh, Matt's question. If you read, if you, when I was saying we need to have a cultural perspective on history, uh, another way you could say that you need to have a literary perspective on history because what the literature unveils is the heart imagination. Now, I've also said two things earlier. I said, we have our resume history and we have our heart history. Historic. Historians tend to operate at the surface. Literature people operate below. We need both. Christopher, I kind of cut off uh, your discussion. Do you have anything else to add or ask or? Do you, uh, do you have a preference uh, just personally uh, between Herodotus and Thucydides? Just as uh, you know, which one you prefer reading more? <laughs> That's all. <laughs> no. What school do you go to? Uh, oh, father's gonna hate this. Uh, yeah, St. John's College in Annapolis. in Annapolis. Oh yeah, in Annapolis. Sure, I know. I know it well. Um, where Jews go to become Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no i know it very well i've some of my uh, best students have gone to st john's and i have great respect for it um no i don't have any opinion on that but you are getting that is a solid education you're getting let's ask emma emma you read thucydides and herodotus which one do you prefer um herodotus but since I've read both of those, I've read Livy, and I really like Livy. He's kind of in between the very intense warlike aspect of Thucydides and the more cultural um, kind of getting to know the people part of Herodotus. I think Livy kind of stands in the middle of that, and I enjoy mm -hmm. that. I like Herodotus best, personally. <laughs> Who is that? Michaela. I think it's Michaela. <laughs> Especially right. the rabbit trails. <laughs> <laughs> um, I so put in a comment about vintage clothes for you, Emma. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And you know I was going to say something about... Sorry, and, go ahead. And you know what I mean by the kind of... Um, gravitas that vintage clothes express. They, they are a whole different kind of aspect of your life. Um, they were made for you. They were more part of your personality and how you perceived yourself. Where it, now today you go into a store and you see what they have made and you try to fit yourself into that. And it's just a whole different perspective on how you see yourself. And yeah. That's great. No, I love it. Look, I hate to say goodbye, but I think it's time to draw this to a close. Um, we're right about at our mark. Um, next week, I don't remember the day offhand. I think it's a week from today. We're going to deal with where can a liberal arts degree get you? Because that's a pragmatic question that a lot of people ask. I was an English major at university. And I cannot tell you how many people said, oh, you want to be a teacher. And actually, I didn't. I, I hated the idea of being a teacher. Um, it was only after God threw me in a classroom and I realized, wow, 
I kind of like this and I'm actually not too bad at it, uh, that I realized my calling was uh, teaching, one of them anyways, one of the hats. Um, so we'll ask the question next week, where can the liberal arts uh, degree get you? I would encourage everyone to come back and bring a friend. Um, again, this is all building interest in St. Andrews College. Uh, it's brand new out of the gate. I think we mentioned last time it's the first college in well over 100 years, uh, Anglican College in America to start. Um, uh, I think I think there's only one university that's actually controlled by the Anglican Church uh, in America, and it's the Episcopal Church, and it's the University of the South in Sewanee, um, which is, I mean, I think it's fair to say it's just gone the way of most other colleges and uh, of its like, and um, it's not a place I would ever send a student from St. Andrews Academy, let's put it that way. Um, it had a great history, um, and I'm sure there's still- They do wear vestments to ex it's exams. Yeah, good, good. That's funny. <laughs> um, so anyways, we'll hit that next week. The other thing is, if anyone has questions about practicalities of what does this look like on a day-to-day -day basis, um, how hard is it really, um, call Emma, talk with Emma, text her, say, hey, I'd like to have a conversation. Uh, I've told her, I said, well, don't tell them all the hardness and the rigor, but, you know, give them a pretty good idea. Um, she went through St. Andrews, graduated St. Andrews, so she's she has got a really clear picture of what we do and how we do it. Uh, Let me ask Christopher a question. Christopher, do they talk about enchantment at St. John's? Uh... I, we, you know, we ask if it, you know, exists or not. Uh, we just read Descartes recently. So now it doesn't exist. Um, but, <laughs> but it's definitely true. Um, yeah, we ask about it. Pascal said, uh, allegedly, I can never forgive Descartes. That was Pascal. Uh, but uh, no, the modern world is a disenchanted world. And uh, we basically teach, um, in other words, when if you teach AP European history, it goes from the age of faith to the age of no faith. I mean, it's basically a continuum of a progressive disenchantment. That's the way the course is generally taught. And um, there's actually more going on in that story than is uh, than we're actually teaching our students. All right, guys. Well, God bless you for next week. Thank you, Dr. Seal. Appreciate your time and uh, the effort. Enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for the questions. Um, hopefully, we'll see you all. And again, spread the word. Uh, the Instagram page is up. Um, None of you are old enough except a few people to, to care that there's also a Facebook page. Uh, ben, your, your mother has figured that one out. Um, so um, do spread the word for us. Again, first Anglican College in almost 150 years. Um, hoping that all of us Orthodox Anglicans out here in America can get behind it and encourage and push things forward. All right. God bless you guys. And have a wonderful night and or evening. Good night. Good night.